Welcome to the Canyoneering Karma Podcast. Your host, Rich Carlson, is here to take you on a journey of learning and exploration. So grab your gear and a rope and follow along. Greetings, Canyon Arrows. Thank you for tuning in. On today's episode, I'm here with my friend Shannon Long to talk about a trip we made to Costa Rica recently and a rescue in one of the canyons. How are you doing, Shannon? I'm doing well, Rich. Good to see you again. So, Shannon, you've become quite an international canyoneer over the last couple of years. You're with me in Monterey, Mexico. You're with me in Morocco. And most recently, this trip to Costa Rica. How are you enjoying this wide variety of canyons you're experiencing? Well, it's been amazing. Uh, Even in the desert southwest, we have quite a variety but this kind of takes that to a different level. There's definitely uh, no jungle in the desert southwest, and, and we saw a lot of jungle in some of these other places, and it's been, uh, it's been very enjoyable. So there were actually two parts to our trip in Costa Rica. Uh, the first thing we did when we went down there is taught a canyon rescue course with an old friend of mine named Mauricio. Uh, Mauricio is an outdoor guide in Costa Rica, and he's heavily involved in search and rescue. I really enjoyed meeting Mauricio. He was a really good guy. I enjoyed teaching with him. Among our students, we had a man who is a part of a three-man team under the Red Cross that's responsible for all technical rescues within the entire country of Costa Rica. Yes, and, and that the gentleman was amazing. Uh, they are responsible for quite a few different kinds of technical rescue in Costa Rica as a part of this Red Cross team. Uh, they not only do high angle rescues, but vehicle extrication, scuba, uh, any kind of waterborne rescue. They really have their hands full in all the disciplines that they have to um, master in order to perform these, these rescues. We had several interesting conversations with him and learned a lot about rescue capabilities in Costa Rica, including the fact that they don't have any rescue helicopters, and if rescues involve canyoneering, they're quite likely to call our friend Mauricio for advice and assistance. Following the canyon rescue course, I was looking forward to making a side trip to Turialba to visit a couple of old friends, Ronald and Mossy. They treated us to some amazing food and a gorgeous little canyon. Coincidentally, it was my birthday. I can't think of a better way to spend it than to explore a nice canyon with old friends, including you. And my wife, Maria, was along. So it was a pretty special birthday. So, yeah, that was an amazing experience. I was so uh, happy and I really appreciate you inviting me along for that trip. It was great to spend some time with Maria and your friends down there. They were amazing hosts. And that was a fun little canyon, um, had a lot of challenges in it that we're not necessarily used to in the Southwest. And so it was a good time. For me, the trip brought back a lot of memories. I used to go to Costa Rica two to three times every year to train canyon guides. Well, I can understand why you'd want to go back there because it, it's a beautiful place and the people were amazing. After Turrialba, we worked our way over to another area of Costa Rica called Bajos del Toro. Yes, we did. And it was up in the mountains and it was it was really beautiful. Beautiful farmlands, beautiful just being in the clouds. I mean, you literally felt like you were in the clouds. It was a uh, r- rural area of uh, Costa Rica that uh, was near a, a volcano, which apparently is where we were going to be doing some of our canyons, was on the side of this porous volcano. So did you enjoy your time there doing the canyons? Uh, I, I did. It was, again, some very different from what I'm used to. I've certainly never been canyoning on the side of a volcano. Uh, but, again, the challenges were a little bit different than what I'm used to. But I enjoyed that part of it. I enjoyed solving those different kinds of problems in these uh, unique canyons. I know you did a, a few different canyons while you were there. But the one I want to talk to you about the most is uh, Mordor... Classico. I understand there was an accident during the descent. There was. And um, and just like with any 
canyon trip that you're going to go on, you need to do a little bit of research. You need to read the beta. Uh, we did have a guide with us, which Sebastian, who was really good and, and helped us with a lot of the logistics and kind of understanding uh, the different ways to approach some of the problems in the canyon. But uh, it's still, having read the, the beta, nothing really prepares you for doing a cane on the side of a volcano. You start out in the jungle, and the next thing you know, you're walking on a moonscape. And you know that the volcano was near. And so it was, uh, it was also similar. The first section, the first half of the canyon was similar to the desert southwest in that it was narrow. Um, it wasn't a slot canyon, as we think about it being really, really narrow, like turned sideways narrow. But there was no escapes in the first half of that canyon. There was no place that you could go up. And the reason this is important, being able to go up, is this canyon is subject to flash floods. And while, uh, as far as we knew, the weather was going to be perfect, uh, the weather in Costa Rica can, can be unpredictable. And the goal for this canyon was to be out of it by around lunchtime so that we help mitigate the risks that are associated with a, with having a storm come in and, and a flash flood. So when I say you couldn't go up, I mean, there was no way to escape a flash flood uh, should one have occurred. So so that kind of helped guide our, our process and guided you know, how we were going to go through this canyon. That was kind of to get through this narrow section as quickly as possible to, to help uh, mitigate that risk for the flash floods. So... So with that in mind, you know, we, we entered this moonscape, we got our can and our harnesses on and started our first repels and, and it was great. The water was amazing. The, um, we were, there were lots of pools and having a guide who's in this cane regularly, he was able to tell us where we could jump. And sometimes if the jump was a little more technical, he could, he could give us some, some tips on how to approach it. And then, of course, if you weren't comfortable with jumping, there was always the option to, to do a rappel. Um, my guys love to do the jumping. It, it does help move things along a little bit faster. Jumping is a little bit faster than, than rappelling until someone has a jump that did not go well and somebody gets hurt. Uh, I had a, a similar incident, and I didn't really – mention it very much, but uh, when we were with your friends, Ronald and his group, there was a little jump that we were doing, and I did it just a little bit incorrectly because I did catch my foot on a rock, and fortunately, it was a short jump, so it just kind of tweaked my ankle, but I remember thinking, jumping is dangerous, even a little jump. Getting injured in a canyon is, is not only bad for you, but it's bad for the group. So the accident in Mordor Classico was a result of a jump gone wrong? During this descent of this canyon, and we were pretty, we were only maybe 25% into this canyon. We had a gentleman um, who was a little bit concerned about a jump. You could tell he was being a little bit hesitant. And um, when he performed the jump, he was just a little bit off balance. And as a result, his foot hit the wall near the bottom, near the water. Um, and at first, I didn't think anything of it because it didn't look like he'd hit the wall itself, but he was just kind of near this this wall. But when he came up for air, he's like, I think I hurt my leg. And uh, And then when he swam to the point where he could stand up, he said, I, I have hurt my leg. He knew he had hurt his leg. And not only that, but he'd also, the, the leg kind of distracted him, but he'd also dislocated his shoulder, both on the same side. And sure enough, he said he couldn't bear any weight at all. It, he said he crunched when he, when he walked. And there's a technical term for that, and it's called bad. Uh, that was bad. And so that changed the whole complexion of that can. It changed we went from being a bunch of folks in a canyon enjoying a nice day, nice weather, uh, fun canyon, to, okay, now we've got a challenge. we got to make some decisions, and we've got to 
figure out how we're going to manage this gentleman who's now uh, broken his leg and dislocated his shoulder on the right side. So it sucks getting injured in a canyon, but looking at the bright side, he was kind of lucky with the group that he was in. I mean, you're a fireman and a paramedic, and as I understand it, there were two other people in the group that were doctors. 100%, and I was just about to say he was more lucky than he realized because we had one doctor who was a an ER doctor, uh, her specialty was pediatrics, but still she had a lot of emergency room experience, and she was able to help us in the splinting of his leg and then also relocating his shoulder. And once his shoulder was relocated, he had almost no pain there. And as long as we didn't do things that re-dislocate it, and unfortunately we re-dislocated a few times, as long as we didn't do that, he could use that arm in a limited fashion, but still enough to maneuver around obstacles. The leg, however, even though we splinted it, he could not bear weight at all. In fact, anything that touched that leg was painful or and touched his foot was painful. So uh, anything below the knee that, that he had to keep that clear, he had to be careful not to bump into anything. He had to be careful not to, to bear any weight on it. So it made it challenging because we couldn't get like under his arms. So if he, if he took his arms and he spread them out and like, like a buddy carry where one person is under each arm and you can kind of be like crutches. He couldn't do that because we kept dislocating his right arm, which is the side coincidentally that was injured for his leg. So, um, but just, just to back up for a second, we had the doctors and they kind of were managing the medical part of this. You know, we did, we did our assessment, we did the splinting, but I knew that we were going to need help. So, once that was kind of handled, I, I sent some folks uh, ahead to say, okay, what does our next problem look like? And so they went to go do that. And then I got a, a, out my inReach, I got my phone in, in my inReach because I knew we were going to need some help. I, I, I also knew that based on our class that we had, the rescue class that we had, I knew that our resources, our external resources were slim and none. Fortunately, Mauricio was not only helped us with our class, but he helped organize a rendezvous. And I knew that he was probably going to be in the area. Um, it turns out he was actually at the house with you when my first inReach messages arrived. Is that correct? It is correct. I remember the first message came in. It just said we had an accident in the canyon. Right. And, and that was just a Initially, I wasn't sure if I was going to be getting through to you or not, so I wanted to send a quick message. Uh, part of the problem with uh, any kind of satellite communications in a canyon is the narrowness of the canyon limits the amount of sky that your device has access to and therefore limits the number of satellites that you have access to. Anyone who's tried to use a, a GPS inside of a canyon knows how inaccurate they are because they can't see satellites with any kind of regularity. So the same problem happens with communications. It's just I sent messages hoping they were going to get through, and then I put all of that away because now I also have to navigate this, this Class C canyon, Swiftwater Canyon with water that's over our heads, and I did not want to risk either my phone or my inReach getting wet and becoming inoperable. So we weren't really sure if this communication was going to work, but eventually you started to get more information. When I got your first message, uh, Mauricio was just a few feet away from me, literally. And there were some other guides in the room that had already returned with uh, other rendezvous participants from other canyons. So I told Mauricio there was an incident and he said, okay, we need more information. And yeah. o over the next, uh, I don't know what it was, the next 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you were sending messages. I was asking you what happened, how serious it is. Can you self-evacuate uh, or do you need help? Right. So I think what was happening with some of that is that we weren't having that normal text conversation like we would have if we were in the States with cell service. I sent a series of messages and then they would go up just whenever a random satellite would pass by. So you were getting 
uh, there was a lot of delay or lag in our communications because of the nature of the communications. Because uh, I later I, I did tell you that okay, we've got you know broken leg, dislocated shoulder. I, you asked who it was. I told you who it was. Um, and then I asked for my. I had two needs that I knew about. I needed in canyon help to transport him, and then we were going to need some out canyon help out of the canyon to get him to you know a hospital. Uh, and the first step of that was just to get him off the mountain. So we needed something that could, because once you got out of the river, you still had like a two mile hike before you got to a road. So I, I knew we had some transportation challenges, and I wanted to get that started as soon as possible. However, I also made the decision that we weren't not going to wait for that help. Uh, I asked for help to come from the bottom, knowing that we were going to need to get him through this technical section. And I was fortunate in that I had several guys that I work with, I train, who've taken your classes, who are trained in some of the techniques that we were going to need to help this person get through the technical parts of the canyon. Um, we did send the guide and one of my key people uh, forward to get help because we didn't know if the satellite communication was going to work or, work or not. We didn't know for probably 30 minutes. So back at the house, we had other rendezvous participants uh, chomping at the bit to get out and get into the canyon to help you. I, I kind of pulled the reins back a little bit because we didn't fully understand the situation yet. We didn't have your location. We didn't know if it was going to make more sense to take you up canyon, out the walls of the canyon, down the canyon. So it was better to wait and get more information. Yes, understood, Rich. Uh, and our group had already decided that the best course of action is just to move down this canyon and get past all of these technical problems, uh, these vertical problems, so that we could get help from the bottom. So one of the messages that you sent me, uh, you said that the guide told you you were at the first cave. I relayed that to the other guys that were in the house and asked them what was in front of you. And I think there was a, a little bit of a miscommunication because the guides told me the only thing in front of you is a couple more vertical problems and then the canyon leveled out. Well, um, you know, one of the interesting challenges of this canyon was we had never been through it before. So I did not know exactly what was in front of us, but it was definitely more than a couple of vertical problems. We were fortunate to have two very capable canyoneers with us, Tyler Withrell and Tim Rotherham. Uh, those guys performed the technical aspects of this rescue. They performed the assisted repels and the lowers. And really that turned out to be the easy part because gravity was on our side. The swimmable pools were also easy because we were just able to, to drag him, to float him from one end to the other. I remember one of the messages that you sent, you were requesting a stretcher. Unfortunately, we didn't have one available. So I turned to the guys and asked them, based on where we thought you were, what would be the simplest way to get you out? The response was a horse. So a couple of people got on the phone and I know they called at least 10 different people trying to find somebody who'd be willing to go up with a horse to meet you guys as you came out of the technical section of the canyon. Unfortunately, uh, we still had quite a rough section of river to go through that included boulder fields uh, and, and just difficult obstacles to, to manage with someone who's injured. If we're just walking, a lot of these obstacles are just short little down climbs. But every time we had a down climb, we basically had to set up a lower. So this was very time consuming. And again, I was fortunate to have Tyler and Tim, who also, when we weren't doing these little lowers, were carrying him through these boulder fields uh, where we couldn't float him and we didn't have him on rope. We had to Physically, I say we, they had to physically carry him until help arrived from the bottom. And then again, we just continued to carry him, uh, taking turns uh, until we were able to get him to the horse. 
It must have been a relief seeing more manpower arrive from the bottom. Kudos to the other rendezvous participants. When I finally let go of the reins, there were five or six people anxious to get out the door and rush into the canyon to help. It was definitely good to see the help arrive. And they showed up with extra water, extra food. And we just took a moment and replenished ourselves and made our plans. We didn't have a litter, so we were going to continue to carry him individually. But now that we had many more rescuers, people that could carry, that was a much easier task because we could we could take turns and not just a few people having to carry all the load. It was a great team effort. I arrived on scene about the same time as the horse. After helping some of your other group members get back to the cars and back to the house, I returned to the trailhead. The owner of the horse walked out, leading the horse with the injured party in the saddle. They arrived back at the cars at about 7 p.m. We transferred the injured party from the horse to a car for transport to the hospital. So the accident happened about 1130, and we had him in a car on the way to the hospital at about 7. That's a pretty good time. Yeah, it was a very good time, especially considering it was a group who self-evacuated. Sometimes people have a misperception of how organized rescues work. They think that if they push a button on their personal locator beacon or dial 911 from their cell phone, that a team of Navy SEALs is going to drop in with a helicopter, rush them to a hospital, and they'll be drinking margaritas within an hour. But that's not reality. If your group relied on outside help, a dispatcher would have to contact team members to get them organized. They may not have even arrived at the trailhead until late afternoon, and it's quite common for people to decide, well, we're here, let's plan on going in first thing in the morning so we don't have to work in the dark. So kudos to you and your team for a job well done uh, in such a timely manner. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things we definitely learned in this game was the difficulty of getting people over difficult terrain. Uh, not just a vertical train, but just across the ground, across boulder fields. And so when you introduced the concept of a caterpillar, that was something that we were I was very interested in. And in fact, when we got back to the house with Mauricio, we put together a training on this caterpillar concept, which was basically allowed us to move someone over difficult terrain without having to carry them over difficult terrain. It's a it's a great technique. So as I understand it, back at the house, you had everybody caterpillaring the sofa around the dining room. Yes, we did. And we were able to caterpillar that sofa without any problems whatsoever. Great technique. Well, I'm glad I was able to put one more tool in your rescue toolkit. But let's hope you never need it again. Bonus material for this episode is available in the podcast section of my website, canyonsandcrags.com. The material includes descriptions and illustrations of some of the rescue techniques described in this episode. Check it out at canyonsandcrags.com. Thank you for joining us at the Canyoneering Karma Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time, have fun, be safe.